let me welcome all of you uh, to the night that we are celebrating, uh, International Human Rights Day, uh, usually December 10th, but because it falls during finals and on a Saturday, we're doing it uh, a little bit early, and also concurrently celebrating the 50th anniversary of uh, Amnesty International. It's been my great pleasure to plan this event with my friend and colleague, uh, Josh Rubenstein, and I'm going to let him uh, be the uh, MC tonight, and I'll say a few words at the end of the evening. Uh, but uh, let me just acknowledge that there's a couple of people that have worked very hard to make this uh, event possible. Uh, one of them is my assistant, uh, uh, Eric Jenkins, and the other one is Leon Rath. They're both down there at the end of the room. Uh, so these lovely audio audio visuals that you see tonight, um, and the uh, uh, and the orchestration of the event is largely due to their uh, careful planning. And uh, I think we're going to have some fun. So let me, uh, without further ado, turn the evening over to to Josh. Thank you. I also want to give a special thanks to Charlie and our friends here at the, at the Carr Center and the Kennedy School for welcoming us here this evening. Um, it's been a very eventful 50 years, as everyone knows. Uh, in order to commemorate it, we brought images, and, and Charlie and his team were very creative in, in getting access to these images of 50 posters to kind of illustrate certain highlights of, of our work over this uh, half century. Um, and also there's a timeline uh, we'll be sharing with you about certain highlights in Amnesty's history. Um, it happens that I'm the longest serving staff member uh, since I started back in 1975, so I thought I'd just share uh, an anecdote or two that kind of uh, reflects a certain growth uh, in the organization. Uh, I came on board in 1975, and then in the fall of 1976, my part-time duties were expanded to organize in the Midwest and South. And one of my first trips was to go to two cities, to Pittsburgh and Cleveland, in the fall of 1976, uh, where we did uh, organize uh, two local groups. And in Pittsburgh that morning, uh, our press officer, a guy named Larry Cox, who just completed uh, five years as our executive director, Larry had arranged for me to be on the morning talk show in Pittsburgh, Pittsburgh AM. And this was the fall of 1976. Bella Abzug was going around the country campaigning for a guy named Jimmy Carter, and she was in the green room next to me. And then they summoned me and for my interview, and the guy introduced me as being from Amnesty Incorporated. <laughs> and he wanted to know our opinion of the Nixon pardon. Well, I had enough experience by that time to understand that no matter what they ask you, you have an idea of what you want to say. So I then made clear what the title of the organization was, uh, explained why I was in Pittsburgh, what the purpose of the organization was, and that night we had a meeting at the Thomas Burton House and we formed what was then Group 39, which I think is still actually a going concern in the, in the city of Pittsburgh. Uh, so that was one highlight from, uh, from those days. And I also had one international experience I'll, I'll share with you tonight. Uh, back in 1985, I was asked by the international movement to spend a couple of months in Israel reorganizing the Israeli section. Um, it was a small section. Uh, a group of younger activists had just taken over the leadership, and they very much wanted to have some assistance. Uh, from the international movement, and I had lived in Israel for a year, and I spoke Hebrew, so I was asked to go. And uh, so I was giving lectures and talks and meeting members and potential members. It's a small country, so all over. And one night I was in a small town uh, in the Galilee, and there's a rule in Israel uh, that no matter what the size of the town, someone has to be up, armed, walking around all night. It's a guard. And in the middle of my talk, and I was discussing the death penalty, and people were challenging me about our work on the death penalty. This is all in Hebrew. This guy comes in with an automatic weapon over his shoulder, because he's the guard, and starts arguing with me about the death penalty. Well, I mean, he was a perfectly nice guy. But I have to say, I didn't anticipate having a debate about the death penalty with someone carrying an automatic weapon over their shoulder. Um, but such is the life of an amnesty activist from time to time. Rose Styron uh, had equally dramatic uh, moments uh, and continues to have them. She's in China tonight, so she's not able to be with us. Uh, and so we were able to interview Rose about some of her 
experiences, particularly in the 60s and 70s. We wanted tonight to have each of our speakers represent certain issues and incidents that took place in each of our decades. And Rose really does go back to the 60s, um, having joined Amnesty when she met, as uh, she'll tell you, if that part is shown. Uh, uh, Ivan Morris, who was a professor of Japanese literature and culture at Columbia, he wrote a famous book on the samurai, actually. Um, and Rose will now tell you, through the wonders of videotape, uh, about her experiences back then. So I give you Rose Styron on the screen. Good evening. I'm Rose Styron. Welcome. I'm so glad you're all here tonight. And I wish I were here in person with you. Um, I was a fellow at the Institute of Politics and I was a founding board member of Amnesty International um, and I'm really sorry that I can't be with he you here in person tonight but after I got this wonderful um, invitation to celebrate Amnesty's 50th anniversary and International Human Rights Day, I got invited to China. And I've never been to China, so I'm going. And Josh and Charlie had ar arranged this film interview instead. So right now, uh, we're celebrating Amnesty's 50th anniversary, but it is also the 50th anniversary of John F. Kennedy's inauguration. Uh, in New York, we didn't get started until 1966 when Ivan Morris uh, brought Amnesty from London and uh, arranged it in his own apartment, actually, uh, on Riverside Drive. Ivan Morris uh, was a professor at Columbia, a professor of Japanese literature who wrote a wonderful book called The Nobility of Failure, which I admired, and I was quite impressed with the um, intellectual academics who were seated in the room. When I arrived and sat in a corner on a divan until they invited me to come and tell them what I had learned in Russia. And they were very welcoming and pretty soon asked me to join the board. And after the tumultuous year that we had had in 1968, um, I was extremely pleased to do that and wanted to do something for human rights. I got to know a number of writers, novelists, poets, journalists from countries in Asia and Africa where there were other kinds of gulags. I had only heard quite recently of the Russian one from One Day in the Life of Ivan Denisovich, which I had read. But because uh, I had done some translations and because we were going back to the United States, uh, any number of writers gave me their manuscripts to bring back to get translated and asked me to tell Washington what was going on in these countries. So I learned a lot and became um, aware of all kinds of human rights abuses I had never known before. I came back, I went to Washington, I tried to tell the State Department what I had learned. They more or less patted me on the head and said, go home. So. About a year after uh, I'd been to Paris, uh, I got a call from London saying, would I be willing to go to Chile to collect information on um, Allende's disappeared ministers and other prisoners of conscience created by Pinochet's coup? And without blinking, I said, Yes, and I asked my 17-year-old daughter, Susanna, who spoke wonderful Spanish, which I did not, to come with me, figuring we could have a mother-daughter uh, Christmas vacation cover. 
and uh, do whatever Amnesty wanted us to, collecting information uh, really for uh, President Allende's widow, Hortense, who was to speak at the UN uh, in a month. And uh, she needed a lot of data on the prisoners, where they were, what their conditions were, how they were being treated, if they were still alive, in order uh, to get the UN to act. Well, I didn't know anyone at all uh, in Santiago, but Janetta Sagan, who had come from San Francisco to brief me at what was then Idlewild Airport in New York, gave me the names of about six people I should try to contact quietly. And if I found one, I could explain why I was there and that person would surely help me. So the first three people I couldn't find. The fourth person I was looking for was a Lutheran priest, uh, Lutheran minister, Samuel Araya, and his wife answered the door. And uh, having no idea who my daughter and I were, invited us in, and when I told her what I needed, she said, oh, well, I can help you right away. Uh, my friends are all the uh, wives of the disappeared ministers, and I will gather them um, at a swimming pool just outside of Santiago at um, a little resort hotel. So if you and your daughter would go to that hotel uh, day after tomorrow and um, put on your swimsuits and go into the swimming pool down below the terrace and throw a big red beach ball back and forth, my friends will know who you are and they will come in disguise and join you in the pool and play uh, ball with you and tell you whatever you need to know about where their husbands are and what conditions they're in or what they don't know. And you can take that back. And they did. And the other things that were most special for me were the people that I met, the extraordinary people through Amnesty, whether it was in Central or South America or Eastern Europe um, or Africa or Russia or Asia. I had, the, I think, the contact with these dedicated, fearless people who often became the leaders of their country or the leading uh, journalists in their country after they were in political prison because they decided there that there was some way um, in their solitude that they needed when they emerged to change their societies. And they did it. They became the leaders of their societies from all different professions but I have to say a lot of them were writers. So whether it was Václav Havel or Arpad Gantz or um, Brighton Breitenbach um, or Kim Dae-jung, um, and even in Central America, uh, several of the Salvadorans and Nicaraguans uh, who I met when I went with Charlie Clemens uh, there. Um, became my ongoing um, friends and conversationalists and informers for what I needed for whatever I was doing over the years. Of course, the thing that was the most fun was 1988, the Amnesty World Rock Tour. So I'll say good night. Thank you all for being here. I hope you have a wonderful long celebration. Happy birthday, Amnesty. Well, it's lovely to have uh, Rose with us and get a sense of her charm and dedication. Uh, 
Uh, our next speaker is, uh, there's a brief description of each of our speakers, so I'll only uh, introduce uh, them with a few words, but it's very special to have Pavel Litvina with us this evening. Um, Pavel became active in the dissident movement uh, shortly after it emerged in 1965-1966 in Moscow. Uh, he edited two major, he subsequently uh, edited uh, two major books that are still primary documents to the history. One is uh, the demonstration of Pushkin Square about a uh, demonstration which includes the transcript of the trial of the demonstrators uh, who were there to protest the arrest, the earlier arrest of their friends. Uh, and then a second, much longer uh, book, uh, The Trial of the Four, which was a major trial in January of 1968. Um, uh, and these are two very important documents he was able to compile uh, before his own arrest. Um, in 1968 um, at the famous demonstration in Red Square. So we're very pleased to have uh, Pavel Litvina. It was uh, in 1972, I believe, it might be 71, I, I, I might be wrong because I don't have any documents left from that day. I was in uh, Siberian exile and uh, once evening I come from work and, and my wife would join me uh, in our hut where we lived in, uh, in, in, in Siberia. I, I worked as an electrician in mines and I came back and she said, look at that. And there was a postcard uh, which came without envelope, but with my name and address. Postcard was uh, written in Russian. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have a copy of the postcard. It was, uh, my house and my apartment in Moscow was searched many times and when one of the searches they, uh, they confiscated this postcard, they confiscated practically everything what <laughs> I, I had in writing over, over the years at the time. Uh, but uh, I remember that postcard. It was written by a kind of foreign uh, handwriting, but in Russian. And it was said, uh, we are a group of students, uh, I'm translating it from my memory from English into Russian, we are a group of uh, students from Holland, and we want uh, to send, it was close to New, New Year and uh, Christmas, I don't remember, it was Christmas or New Year, uh, uh, congratulations, and we uh, wish you uh, health and something else, uh, some, uh, some other kind of words, uh, very neutral, and at the bottom uh, said that we are a group of, uh, of Dutch students, and then there were two letters, AI. And at that time, maybe it was not even two letters. Maybe in Russian it was written Bizarodne Amnistia, Amnistia International. I, I don't remember. But I remember that I immediately knew that it was a letter, uh, that postcard came uh, from a group of Amnesty International. Although I knew about Amnesty very little, but already enough to understand what Amnesty is doing. So it was a group in Holland who somehow managed to reach me. Remember, uh, my mail was completely censored. I practically didn't receive letters from my parents. The only way uh, and any friends from Moscow or from anywhere, I, uh, basically all of that was cut and I just couldn't find that complaint, but never, uh, never got any uh, answer to those. Occasionally I would get. Suddenly I got this, uh, this postcard and my wife and I we were so happy just to get this message from outside from uh, from somewhere so it's a uh, first time I kind of got uh, understood that I was adopted prisoner of my amnesty of course I, I knew that I wouldn't be released because I, that letter and nothing would change in my life but I remember that it was tremendous uplifting and we really such such letters uh, would reach political prisoners. They would never reach in, uh, in labor camps. But uh, my friend, uh, uh, activist well-known uh, of human rights, who spent many years in labor camp, his name is Sergei Kualev, and I think many people here know uh, his name, he told the interesting story that when he was in a special uh, regime labor camp in one of the worst uh, labor camps in uh, so-called 76 in Perm. Now, uh, surprisingly, they have a museum in, the, in that camp. 
the only labor camp museum in, in, in Russia, which is some kind of progress, but that's a different story. And uh, Sergei Kovalev uh, once organized a, a, a hunger strike. And there was a group of prisoners who were on hunger strikes there. And uh, because of that hunger strike, inside of the terrible labor camp, he was put in special camp within the camp. Uh, so, uh, pre uh, I'm sorry, uh, prison in, in, in a camp where he would got hot water every other day and piece of bread every other uh, day for, for a month. And during that time, he was in, uh, interrogated by uh, head of the camp or second in command, who was asking, uh, you start that uh, hunger strike, who organized it? And of course, he didn't answer. Uh, we know that it's, it, it's known abroad uh, that your uh, uh, hunger strike started. Who, say, who sent the information abroad? Of course, uh, Sergei didn't answer to those questions. And he knew that it was somehow Sergei was the central figure, the major figure in that hunger strike with uh, demands to, to be recognized as prisoners of conscience and, and the improvement in food and, and, and other uh, protests. And uh, eventually that uh, camp uh, guard, the uh, colonel of something, uh, asked him, uh, you know that, uh, that we know uh, uh, that you send those things abroad and you, it won't help you. We know that you can write to Amnesty International, to Roman Pope, uh, to Pope in Rome, to English Queen, it, it, it won't help you. Nobody reads those things. And, uh, what do you hope? And Sergei quietly told him, well, you read it. And the colonel was, uh, was, was very sad. No, I didn't read it. Uh, Sergei told him, not only uh, somebody else read it, but that somebody else, uh, some of your superiors, even told you. And that's something. And uh, the colonel was quite embarrassed and stopped the conversation. So that's what the MS International does. Even if it doesn't reach people like I was lucky to receive that thing, the fact that it circulates, it creates a special atmosphere. And that creates publicity, it creates hope, and the Soviet officials, they, they, whatever they are, they are human, and they don't like uh, to know that some of, of, of their terrible things, how they beat up uh, prisoners, how they uh, uh, unfairly sent them, sent them to mental hospital or labor camp, and it all became, became known. And uh, it was like, and it happened to, in, in all those countries where Amnesty was active, uh, that, uh, that, that authorities were, uh, were embarrassed by that activity. Of course, Amnesty is not the only organization, but the very fact that there is people from grassroots, students, uh, some uh, people were uh, loosely organized in different countries, in different towns, in the United States, in England, anywhere, that they send the letters and they uh, know that it makes a difference in, uh, in, in camps and it makes a difference uh, in, in, in opinion. And the concept of uh, prisoner of conscience, of course, one of the central concepts and the great invention of the Amnesty International, not political prisoner, but prisoner of conscience, the person who never advocated violence, can or reduce violence. So that creates special atmosphere, special class. And I got into, uh, into my exile, in, first in prison in Moscow, then in exile, as uh, uh, Joshua told, because I organized uh, uh, publications for human rights, was one of the early leaders of human rights movement, and eventually demonstration against Soviet invasion of, of Czechoslovakia. But what our activity was all about, our activity was writing and defending human rights of other people. So we actually were doing what Amnesty International was doing. Our ideas, our principles were the same. It was not political prisoners. We were not left, not right. Uh, but we supported everybody who was arrested and put in prison because of their beliefs. And that's important because in political uh, labor camps in any country, there are all types of people. Some of them are, are great writers and scientists. Some of them are very really strange people. But all of them, if they 
were put in prison because they spoke their mind, they deserve support. And MC International was unique. Uh, it, it was started specifically for that purpose. Our movement for human rights, the dissident movement, was not a political movement, but it was a movement for possibility of political movement in the future. And, and freedom of speech is a central uh, idea, and there is nothing better, because uh, the world in which we live uh, cannot improve until everybody could speak their mind. And that's what, what, what I want uh, to tell you, and I'm very grateful, uh, and I joined Ennis International, was on, on its board, and I, I believe that its activity has a central theme, and that theme is, is defense of individual rights to speak. But of course there are other themes, uh, uh, abolishing of death penalty, I'm uh, very proud to be American, but I'm very ashamed that America still has, has death penalty. Even Putin's Russia, which is <laughs> nothing in common with America, doesn't have death penalty. And the very fact, in spite of all terrible things which, uh, which is happening in today's Russia, uh, the very fact that, any, uh, that uh, death penalty doesn't exist there, and hopefully won't be resumed, in spite of some pressure uh, to do it, it already creates a certain climate that it's very far from victory for human rights, but I think we have to continue the work for abolishing of, uh, of death penalty in the United States. Thank you. Very nice to have you with us, Pablo. We're going to go to a different part of the world now to West Africa. Uh, Sawari Omoyele uh, remains uh, an active voice for human rights and environmental protection in his native Nigeria. Sawari lives in, works out of New York City. Uh, he's been very gracious to join us this evening. He was with us a few weeks ago at our regional conference across the river at Boston University. And so it's, it's uh, wonderful of him always to uh, take an opportunity when we invite him to share his story. I believe we'll have a little timeline as well, uh, bringing the story into the 1980s, and then we'll hear from Sawari. Thank you and good evening to everybody for coming uh, to this event. I just want to quickly say that uh, it's always a pleasure, Josh, uh, to be part of Amnesty International events, and I will do everything I can, uh, whatever possible, to, to be part of this. Uh, after we had a conference last week, I did something unthinkable. Uh, which is going back to Nigeria. I actually just came back from Nigeria three days ago. Uh, the difference is that just like everybody travels through their own airport, I have my own airport, which is traveling on the ground in Nigeria. Uh, if I got caught uh, as of last week, I would be, you'll be campaigning to get me out of jail by now. Uh, but I'm back safely, so with a wall of dust and the exhaust fumes in my system. I come from Nigeria, and I'm always very proud to say, and you know, to make you understand it a bit, I tell people that I come from Nigeria by way of New Jersey, because that's where I live now. Uh, I've been here since year 1999, and exactly 10 years before 1999, in 1999 I got admission to the University of Lagos. Uh, but we had a different set of challenges in those days. It was military rule. And our job as young people, uh, inspired by the fresh Tiananmen Square protests, was to drive the military out of power in Nigeria to give our people the broadest possible uh, fundamental rights, especially the one of democracy and the right to choose their own leaders. Uh, we thought it was going to be something that would take just a few protests. Uh, it didn't happen. It took me 10 years uh, in Nigeria. Out of that 10 years, I went to jail eight different times. I'd like to make a distinction between where I find myself or how I define my experiences. I do not see myself lightly as a prisoner of conscience because I didn't spend a lot of time in prison, like many other people who have spent a great deal of time in prison. But I describe myself mostly as a victim of torture. And torture sometimes can be worse than spending a long time in prison because 
Whereas prison is meant to break you over time, torture is meant to break you at once. And it's the most difficult uh, experience anybody can have. Because there you are combining being restricted, unable to go anywhere, uh, with a fear of constant beating and abuse by authorities. And I went through it so much that by the time I came here in 1999, I thought life was over. Uh, but I checked into a program in New York for survivors of torture, and that's how I became part of the system here. And also part of Amnesty International campaign since 2000, uh, which was a renewed campaign against torture. And it took me to almost all the states in the U.S. Sometimes I went to certain cities uh, more than 10 times just to talk about my personal experiences. And what were they? It was that I led legitimately and peacefully uh, student movements and protests against the military. And the only weapon we would have, if we had anything at all, would be figs or leaves. Uh, with which we peacefully sang and protested against the military singing songs that tells people that military rule is bad for Nigeria. Because Nigeria did not only have military rule at that time, corruption was rampant. Uh, we are one of the largest exporters of oil, as you must have heard. The sixth largest exporter of oil to the U.S. and one of the sixth largest in the world. Uh, but it's ironic that just as we make more money from oil, our environment becomes destroyed and the money that we make from oil goes into buying weapons for the military which they in turn use in oppressing the people of Nigeria of which I became a major victim in those days. But there are several of them and I'm not, like I keep saying, not the most qualified. A lot of people have been broken beyond the point that they can even talk about the experiences. But that's the idea of uh, torture. Uh, and of course it's the reason why they keep people behind bars for a long period of time. And I would say that I did not know about Amnesty International in those days very much, except on one occasion when I had my second arrest in which I was held in a detention facility in Lagos uh, that is known as an intercenter. It's an intercenter, uh, they call it intercenter, but it's actually a detention facility that is built within a cemetery. And if they're taking you there, it would be as if you are going to be buried. And then they will make a detour and this facility comes up. And you know, when you have nothing to do, you start screaming your name uh, with your nail on the wall. Because everybody who's been through that place tried to write their name on the wall. So I spent a lot of time trying to scribble my name on the wall so that whatever happens, somebody will know that I passed through that experience. Because they will never admit, it's never on record that you're detained there. And one day, when I got to SOW, which is my last name, which everybody calls me by, uh, the guy who was my deten uh, detention officer only communicated with the state security service, secret police, by radio. And he said, you know, they have heard that my case had become an international case. And I said, how is that possible? Because nobody even know where I'm at. And he said, well, Amnesty International and the U.S. Embassy had been calling for my release, and I was very shocked and surprised at the same time. Uh, so when I came out of here uh, to the U.S., one of the things that I wish I did was to be able to use my experiences to tell the story, to mobilize people in this country at that time, who were becoming frustrated that letter writing wasn't doing anything to free prisoners of conscience. And I said, no, you don't even have an idea. If you have a government that spends half of its time trying to get rid of letters, that are written by Amnesty members, they are really worried that those letters means a lot uh, to getting things done. And it was at the time, also in the 2000s when I came here, that young people were also beginning to get ans you know, uh, their own answer about letter writing because it was the advent of internet and social media. And I spent time trying to explain to them that instead of using social media uh, to look for partners, they could actually use it to free people because that's one of the best convictions I had as a student activist it was taking a decision about between going to a party where I was supposed to find a girlfriend that would last me for four years in college and going to a meeting that would free the country so that people could recognize and have a right to choose whomever they want. And that made a whole lot of difference. So this is just a short story about the importance of what you do. You know, um, In 2001, after September 11, I can never forget this, I was invited by an amnesty group 
uh, to come and speak somewhere in Connecticut. And the principal asked me to join him at home the day before. I thought it was about meeting his family. And when it was a little bit late, he came to me and said, you know, uh, we love the way you speak, but don't talk about torture or those things that will offend the U.S. government. This country is not in the mood uh, at this time uh, to talk about freedom as you used to before September 11. Um, I almost wept because I could never believe that people could be uh, that short-sighted to think that national security will ever any day trump fundamental human rights. Uh, but I got out enough strength to say to him, I said, the reason why I must step out there tomorrow and speak about this is because you live in the U.S. and you are afraid of your government. Uh, nobody should be afraid of their own government. And no reason should allow you or should make you have to think about not speaking out against power. Because that is why I'm less international exists. If I'm not able to speak my mind tomorrow, I'll go back home where I come from, in New Jersey. And I did. And it made a whole lot of difference. Some of the kids I spoke to there have gone to college, some of them have graduated, and they write me all the time and say thank you that you stood up and said to the world what needed to be said when nobody wanted to speak. So it's just to say to you, great thanks for what you do. It's really, really important. And I'm always glad to say that you have changed the world, and the world is not going to be the same again simply because you write letters. It's not just letters, it is freedom that you write on paper and send to different parts of the world. Thank you. Uh, we'll be hearing from Bill Schultz in a minute, who was our executive director from 1994 to 2006, played a major role in leading Amnesty International in this country and in different parts of the world and with the international movement. I know he was on some international missions. I remember uh, some grim stories about his time in Sudan, especially. Um, um, before we hear from Bill, who's now working with the Unitarian Universalist Service Committee here in Cambridge, uh, we'll update our timeline and, and bring it into the 1990s. Good evening. I am often asked by students how can I, too, become Executive Director of Amnesty International? And I always tell them, have a very stubborn friend on the search committee. Because that's exactly how I became Executive Director. I had very few credentials as a human rights leader, but I had a very stubborn friend named Phil Villers on the search committee. And every time the committee tossed out my resume, Phil would throw a fit, and the committee would throw it back into the mix just to keep him quiet. And eventually they were exhausted by his persistence, and they gave me an interview. And I guess I did okay, because as Josh said, I was there for 12 years. Amnesty gave me the opportunity to meet courageous people like Paul and Solore, like Sergei Kovalev, like Wei Jing Sheng, the father of Chinese democracy. When Wei was released from prison after 17 years, I met him in New York and I said to him, Wei, Amnesty folks have been writing thousands and thousands of letters on your behalf. Did you ever get any of those letters? He said, I never got a single one, but I always knew when people were writing and when they were not. When they were writing, the guards unscrewed the one light bulb that was on 24 hours a day in my cell. Old way they said, you're getting a lot of letters. And when the letters would dissipate, the light bulb would be screwed back in. It gave me the opportunity to meet a drunken Harrison Ford and a charming Angelina Jolie. It gave me the opportunity to be, as Josh uh, alluded to, to the experience, to be faced with uh, five machine guns uh, pointed at me, held by uh, five young child soldiers hopped up on ganja in Sudan. Gave me the opportunity to be tailed by the secret police in Tunisia. Gave me the opportunity to be threatened with assassination by Charles Taylor of Liberia. I led an amnesty mission in 99 to Liberia prior to a so-called election when Taylor's slogan was, vote for me or I'll kill you, and he meant it. 
the opposition newspaper held an interview uh, with me as the head of the delegation and uh, asked the question, um, should war criminals be allowed to run for president? Now, Amnesty was very cautious about taking positions on political candidates, and I said, Amnesty takes no position on who should run for president, but we do, of course, believe that war criminals should be brought to justice. And the next day, in the opposition newspaper's front page headline, you may not run for president says Dr. Schultz of Amnesty International. So I went into the newspaper and I said, you've got to correct that. That's not what I said. And I reiterated what I had said. Oh, we understand, they said. And the next day, in far larger print, you will be booked, says Dr. Schultz of Amnesty International. <clears throat> the next night, uh, my colleagues, in the delegation were meeting with a woman named Millie Buchanan, who was Charles Taylor's Girl Friday in uh, Liberia at the time. And Millie Buchanan said, uh, Charles Taylor, Mr. Taylor has a, a message for Dr. Schultz. Tell him that uh, he is uh, very concerned for his health. Tell him that he will be booked. He will be booked by a bullet if he stays in Liberia and he ought to keep his back, his eye on his back in New York. I was leaving on Air Revoir, uh, and uh, I was happy to leave Liberia, and uh, I didn't go back uh, until Charles Taylor was uh, successfully himself booked at the International Criminal Court. We've seen in this timeline many of the magnificent things that Amnesty did. Amnesty was also a troubled organization when I took over in 1994, was troubled by many internal problems I won't allude to go into in detail, but it was also plagued by self-imposed policies that severely restricted its relevance and its, its effectiveness. In 1994, for example, no national section of amnesty was permitted to research or give opinions about or act on human rights issues in its own country. And this meant that with the exception of death penalty cases, Amnesty USA was to remain mute about violations of human rights committed by the United States. Amnesty, by policy, refused to join coalitions with other NGOs. Amnesty refused to work on social and economic rights issues. Amnesty only begrudgingly acknowledged that there were such things as gay and lesbian rights, beyond the fundamental right not to be mistreated or killed for your sexual orientation. Amnesty took no position one way or the other on military interventions, and Amnesty refused to take any money from a donor that was designed or designated for a specific program or purpose. Well, one of the fascinating things as I look back over this history is how much Amnesty has changed since the 1990s. Not because of me, but because of the evolution of the organization. Virtually all of those policies that I cited uh, are no longer part of Amnesty's life. But what is more interesting to me even than this inside baseball is how the human rights world has changed and changed indeed during the 12 years I was with the organization. Shortly before I left in 2006, I gave a speech at Syracuse University and before the dinner, the president of the university sat down with me and about 10 or 12 faculty members, and he said, has the human rights situation improved or worsened over the last 200 years? And without exception, all of the professors described the ways in which human rights were worse today than they were 200 years ago. And after all this moaning and groaning, I could contain myself no longer. And in my customarily tactful way, I said, are you guys nuts? I said, why, well, just in the 12 years that I have been with Amnesty, we've seen huge growth in democracy around the world. We've seen war crimes tribunals for the former Yugoslavia, Rwanda, Sierra Leone. We've seen the British law lords rule in 1999 that the Gusto Pinochet was not protected by the concept of sovereign immunity. We've seen the creation 
of the International Criminal Court. We've seen all but two countries ratify the Convention on the Rights of the Child. We've seen the U.S. Supreme Court rule unconstitutional the execution of children and the mentally retarded. And you don't think that we are better off today than we were when Thomas Jefferson, a slaveholder, could get elected president of the United States? These were academics, so that had absolutely no influence on them whatsoever. But I felt much better about it after I had said it. As I look back on what preoccupied us at Amnesty from the time I arrived in 1994 through 2000, where Alex will take up, the first marker, of course, was the genocide in Rwanda, which began only three or four months after I did. For uh, for uh, me, those events will always be encapsulated in a story that Philip Gorovich tells in his moving account of the genocide. We wish to inform you that tomorrow we will be killed with our families. A story of a girls' school that was attacked in the middle of the night by machete-wielding militiamen. The girls were rousted from their beds about 2 a.m., forced to line up in the dining hall, and then and then to separate themselves by ethnic group, Hutu over here, Tutsi over there, so that all of the Tutsi uh, could be slaughtered. But not a one of the girls moved. And a second time, the commander ordered them to divide up by ethnic group, Hutu over here, Tutsi over there, and for a second time, not a one of the girls moved. And then finally, one of the little girls, naturally terrified, raised her hand timorously. I'm sorry, she said. I'm sorry, she said, but we cannot separate ourselves. We cannot separate ourselves, you see, because in this school, we are not Hutu. We are not Tutsi. We are all just Rwandan. We are all just little Rwandan girls. At which point, Urvich says, every one of the girls was slaughtered. Uh, it is certainly to the eternal shame of the U.S. government that it failed to support the intervention. President Clinton later apologized. It is to the eternal shame of all of us in the human rights movement that we failed to convince it to do so. It's certainly true that the fallout from that genocide still haunts us today, most notably in Congo. But consider what happened a few years later in Kosovo. Consider how the international community responded to the post-election uprisings in East Timor in 2002, to the violence at the soccer stadium in Guinea in 2009, to the violence that flared in Cote d'Ivoire in 2010 when President Gabo refused to step down. He was, just two days ago, extradited to The Hague to stand before the ICC. Most notably, consider what happened in Libya. It would be foolish to predict that a Rwanda or a Srebrenica, which came the next year, could not happen again. We saw the international community duck its responsibilities in Darfur, and now we see today what is happening in Syria. But it is also true that between the interventions I just cited and the growing power of international justice, a new ethos is at last beginning to flicker to life, an ethos that sets limits to the behavior of tyrants. So progress is real, and human rights norms evolve in a progressive fashion. We would have been astonished in 94, for example, to know of the number of nations and states that by 2011 would have legalized same-sex marriage. In the United States in the 90s, of course, the human rights movement had it relatively good with President Clinton in office and friends like Alex in positions of influence, certainly compared to what was soon to descend upon us with the Bush administration. That's Alex's story to tell. But suffice it to say that there's nothing of which I'm prouder uh, of my, uh, during my years at Amnesty, than AIUSA's response to the human rights outrages perpetrated by George Bush and his minions. By that time, thank God, we had been unshackled from amnesty's absurd restrictions on working on our own country's violations. And I wear it as a badge of honor to have been attacked publicly by the President, Vice President, Secretary of State, Secretary of Defense, and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff in the course of 48 hours when amnesty called Guantanamo Bay the gulag of our times. So 
it was an enormous privilege for me to serve for 12 years, offering, as it did, uh, an opportunity to combine my passion for global politics with my moral and religious convictions, at the heart of which resonates uh, the message of that young girl's voice, we are not Hutu, we are not Tutsi, we are all just little Rwandan girls. That sentiment expresses what is most fundamental about human rights and the echoes of that, that young girl's voice bespeak a graciousness which I tried to serve and for which the world continues to be desperate. It's good to see that Bill hasn't lost the passion he brought to his job when he was our executive director. Let me just elaborate on one point in my own history uh, that just highlights the frustration we felt over the restrictions, especially not working in our own country. Uh, Amnesty issued a comprehensive report on human rights in the U.S. in, I think, 98, called Rights for All. And, well, we had the idea up in Boston since one of the focuses was conditions in prison, particularly for women in prison, that I had a meeting with about a dozen uh, activists uh, in the Boston area in Massachusetts who were working in women prison, uh, particularly in Framingham, among women prisoners. And I gave a copy of the report and I described what our priorities were and how we could work together going forward. And halfway through the meeting, I felt very uncomfortable. I felt uncomfortable because I only knew one person in that group of people. And I, already, I had already been a, uh, the regional director for over 20 years. I'm not a wallflower. I really do try to get out and meet people and work with them and have coalitions. And I realized that over that time when we got calls from families or lawyers, what's going on in the prison in Concord or prison in Framingham, and I'd say, well, you're welcome to send a document. I'll send it to the research team in London, but I can't do anything about it. Um, and so I felt very uncomfortable um, that I really only knew one person in that whole group. So we have gone beyond that, and those changes did prepare us, as Bill made clear, to confront the Bush administration. Uh, we are one of many voices, of course, in that decade. We'll now hear from Alexandra Ariaga, uh, Alex, uh, who is our esteemed colleague in Washington. Uh, and so thank you very much uh, for inviting me here today. Thank you, Charlie and Josh, for your leadership over so many years and for advancing human rights in so many parts of the world. Um, and it's um, such a privilege to be here with uh, this distinguished group. You can also see why Bill Schultz was such an effective leader of Amnesty International and, and continues to be such an important voice for human rights. My involvement with Amnesty uh, became, began uh, at a very early age, and it began because my parents are from Chile and Argentina, and as a child we would travel a lot to Latin America to visit my relatives since we go all the way down to the very end of South America. We would stop in different countries along the way, and so I saw a lot as a child. And in the late 1970s, just a few years after the coup in Chile that ushered in the horrific regime of the military junta, my parents um, decided that they would move to Chile, which was a little bit odd, but it was in 19, the end of 1977 and the start of 1978. And so it was um, after the worst of the abuses had already subsided. Uh, prior to that, I had had family members who had been directly affected, who had been taken to the stadium, and who had been able to be taken out of the stadium. Um, so we had been able to protect most of our immediate family, um, but we also had uh, a lot of friends who had been exiled uh, who, or who had been killed. But my, my mom, in particular, really wanted to be near her family at that time. And so we were there for about a year and a half. And uh, during that time period, I became keenly aware that although the worst of the abuses, the disappearances, the torture, the arrests, um, had stopped, that there was still an enormous amount of repression and intimidation 
and um, that there was a lot going on and that the fear was palpable among adults. So I was aware of all of this and in, at the same time I saw that in uh, the international community that Chile was getting more and more attention and that there was an organization named Amnesty International that was really prodding the president, uh, then President Jimmy Carter, to make Chile the focus of its human rights agenda. So the United Nations took up the cause and the military junta decided that they would have a plebiscite and that they would have a referendum to determine the legitimacy of their rule. It was sort of an odd thing to do, but they were really just trying to, to show the international community that they were in fact seeding and they would actually ask the people what they believed. So a friend of mine who was a young woman decided that uh, she was going to vote no. And she was, uh, the strength of her convictions, she would go to the polling station and vote no. So she went and um, as she approached there was a large group of people and she joined the line and there were soldiers with their guns prodding people into line. So already it felt like this was going to be a tough thing to do. She arrived with her credentials. They gave her a ballot. They wrote down her uh, identification information so she wasn't sure if it aligned with the ballot. It was a transparent ballot. She marked no, handed it to the person. She couldn't put it in a ballot box. They opened it. They looked at it and said, you can't vote. And then a soldier started coming towards her, and she ran. And she ran to safety. And, uh, and she told us about this when she got home. So um, the next day, I remember seeing the headlines that the military junta had won. You know, they had this overwhelming victory. And of course, it was all fraud. And it was all based on fear. And very few people were willing to risk their lives for good, you know, for good reason um, and really vote their conscience. But at the same time, the sentiment in the country was that the military may have won that particular battle, but they had lost the war because we knew that the world was watching and we knew that things would change. And so, um, so at that time, uh, I also had family in Argentina and the experiences both in Chile and Argentina were very powerful to me and showed me very clearly the role that an organization like Amnesty International had and so it taught me an enormous lesson. And that lesson was that the world makes a difference and it is our responsibility to stand up for those in other parts of the world when they need our help. So many years later, I worked for the US Congress for Congressman Tom Lantos, who was a great leader for human rights. And then um, I worked in the Clinton White House. And when I was there, I had the privilege of returning to Chile for the inauguration of President uh, Ricardo Lagos, who himself had been exiled. And this time when I arrived, there was enormous celebration in the streets because we were celebrating the uh, democratically elected head of state of now a country that, where human rights were the norm. And it was just an enormous, uh, wonderful, wonderful experience. So that was my introduction to Amnesty International. And then when Amnesty called me in 2001, I couldn't say no. I was very eager to come and join them in Washington, D.C. And of course, I started in August of 2001, just three weeks before September 11. And that was such an extraordinary time. Uh, it was, it's very difficult to think about the decade of 2001 through 2011 because it was such a transformational time for human rights and amnesty was really at the center of the human rights discourse. We witnessed the devastating attacks of September 11 and that seemed to really shape the very foundation of human rights doctrine. Across the globe we also saw uh, the, the, the 
cruelty perpetrated against women and girls in conflicts like the Democratic Republic of Congo and Afghanistan. We also finally called genocide genocide in the case of Darfur, and yet we struggled to determine how to respond effectively. And in recent years, we've seen uh, and come to know a whole new category of prisoner of conscience, as, as we've talked about earlier tonight, you know, the prisoner of conscience whose voice, voice is magnified through the internet. And we've seen revolutions take hold through Facebook and the power of live feed on YouTube. So it seemed like everything changed on September 11, as across this country and around the world, shock, fear, deep sadness, and an unfamiliar sense of vulnerability took hold. And in the midst of this turmoil and of this reeling and disorientation, Amnesty stood up very quickly and firmly to say that the framework for human rights remained intact and that such a seminal moment required moral and just leadership and that it was critical to have this moral and just leadership in order to combat such evil in both the short and long term. The war on ter terror referred to a new kind of war that required new thinking, and the term was used to justify old methods that had long been delegitimized. Uh, we were talking about suspending habeas corpus, about disappearing detainees, incommunicado detention, and whether or not uh, torture was justified, and what constitutes torture, and who's a prisoner of war. We looked at uh, horrific images of Abu Ghraib, and we learned uh, about what was happening in Guantanamo. And then we sent our soldiers to Afghanistan and Iraq. And through all of this time, we were examining whether a new human rights framework was needed. Amnesty joined very large coalitions and led across the country in, in holding protests. We uh, organized with the broadest coalitions possible. We, we partnered with allies, many in the Massachusetts delegation, Congressman Markey, who's, who stood up and said extraordinary renditions are not acceptable. Congressman McGovern and Congressman Delahunt, who said we cannot torture. And we went to the Pentagon and to the White House and to in every corner we could possibly think of. And here, it was interesting to me because I had been used to the discourse of human rights, which is very tough language, but I had a whole new vocabulary to learn and I was not expecting this. But I frequently found myself in meetings with military leaders and with intelligence officers and we would be talking about what the United States was doing. And, um, and at the time, they were looking at rewriting the Army Field Manual and and defining what is torture and what is acceptable. And I remember having this very concrete conversation and suddenly the general starts talking sports. <laughs> oh, crud. Because I'm not really, I, I don't follow sports very closely and, and there he is, he's talking about, well, you know, we have the playbook and, and we're getting our knees dirty in the yard line and there's the quarterback and I'm thinking, I don't know, what he's saying, but can I get the conversation back on the concrete real terms? And I go home that night and I'm telling my husband, you know, he's talking about the quarterback and he's talking about the playbook and this and that. And he said, Pfft. and he explained to me what he was saying, which I sort of picked up, but I didn't know the analogy to come back with, which was basically that the United States was really testing the, the waters. It was really that they were pushing the line, uh, according to the military, uh, they were pushing the line uh, to, to carry out what they considered to be acceptable. And of course, the amnesty did not consider the same terms as what was acceptable. So he taught me a new term, which was, you know, next time I'm in, I'm in a situation like that, I now know the football term, which is that uh, I, say, I have to say, you know, sir, with all due respect, you are the quarterback, you have the playbook, 
but it's time to call an audible. <laughs> you have to and make your own decisions and you know what is actually the right thing to do. So through these terrible times, Amnesty was really a beacon and stood firmly in defense of human rights, uh, urging our le leaders to win the hearts and minds with moral and just leadership. At the same time, I also think it's important to note that Amnesty launched another major campaign which I believe changed the dynamics in the human rights community, and that was the Stop Violence Against Women campaign. We saw reference to uh, campaigns Amnesty had done previously for women, but even so, within the realm of the human rights community, usually when we were talking about women's human rights, unfortunately, there was um, a sort of an acquiescence that these abuses were basically inevitable. That, they, that the mistreatment of women and the horrific violations that were taking place were part of conflict, that they were difficult to deal with because there's a culture, it's private, there's not really a role for governments, you can't hold them accountable. And Amnesty International taking on the Stop Violence Against Women campaign within the realm of the human rights community was quite important because it put it squarely on the agenda. It made it changed the dynamic and affirmed that abuses against women and girls are not acceptable, that they are violations of human, right, human rights, and that they must be stopped. And it took the issue out of the sidelines and put it prominently on the global agenda. There are so many disturbing images, even today, of what happens to women. Every time I think about these images, I uh, am always astounded that I will hear another story that is even more shocking and that will demonstrate the depths of cruelty that humankind is, is, is capable of. And I'm uh, reminded of uh, Major General Patrick Hamyard, uh, who has done enormous work around the world. He was a peacekeeper in many countries and a military leader and uh, found himself psychologically unprepared for the brutality he witnessed in Eastern Congo and said that it is more dangerous to be a woman than a soldier in the Congo. Uh, the abuses are profoundly immoral. I agree with, um, with Bill that I think there is finally an ethos that is taking hold that we cannot allow this to take place. And in the international community, when we look at the United Nations, and even in the U.S. government, there are steps being taken now to try to address these abuses more systematically, understanding that abuses against women are the responsibility, and that they do are part of the human rights agenda, that they are the responsibility of governments and leaders to, to address. So, as we look at events in the Middle East, in Burma, in Cote d'Ivoire, uh, it reminds me that uh, we see so clearly the powerful yearning for freedom and universal human rights. We're confronted with the reality that we live in a very small planet, the technology dissolves borders, and we feel more poignantly our sisterhood and brotherhood with fellow activists around the world. Each of us can make a difference each of us one by one. Amnesty teaches us that when we do it together, we'll get there much faster. And I think that that's the power of Amnesty International, and it's the power of the movement going forward. Thank you. So I'm sure that some of you are old enough to remember the, uh, the TV show where Superman goes into a telephone booth that changes his clothes. Well, I don't have a telephone booth handy, but... <laughs> now, what I want you to appreciate is how gingerly you have to wash a t-shirt like this uh, for it to survive uh, 23 years. But uh, this is from the uh, Human Rights Now tour in 1988, uh, where I was inspired by uh, Amnesty and uh, thousands of other 
were as well around the world. In fact, I think the count was some millions attended those concerts uh, around the world. So it's a privilege tonight to be able to celebrate this organization and look back over its uh, 50 years. Uh, the first truly international conference on human rights took place in Tehran in 1968 that celebrated the 20th anniversary of the UDHR, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. And there was not another global human rights meeting for 25 years until the Vienna Conference of 1993. And in Vienna, because the Cold War had ended, there was great hopes for moving the politics of human rights forward beyond the impacts that had suffered in the East and West confrontation. However, that was temporarily stalled when Syria, Iran, and China led the attack on the universality of human rights, claiming they were grounded in Western morality, and further that uh, forcing these norms on non-Western societies was a form of cultural imperialism. There was a larger chorus, which among others included Syria, Yemen, Vietnam, Cuba, and many other countries in the Middle East. As previously noted, Singapore, Indonesia, Vietnam, and Malaysia are now part of the ASEAN Commission on Human Rights, although they were in that camp challenging the universality of human rights in 1993. Cuba surprised the world in 2008 by signing the two conventions on the International Bill of uh, Human Rights that had long opposed the Convention on Civil uh, and Political Rights and the Convention on Economic, Social, and Cultural Rights. But I think the canard that human rights are not truly universal has been relegated to the trash bin of history by the action of courageous peoples this year uh, in the Arab Spring. This year, millions of people decided the time to come to claim their rights. They took to the streets and demanded change. Many found their voices using the internet and instant messaging to inform, inspire, and mobilize supporters to seek their basic human rights. Social media helped activists organize peaceful protests, movements in cities across the globe, from Tunis to Madrid, uh, Madrid to Cairo to New York, at times in the face of violent repression. So let us observe a moment of silence for those who sacrificed their lives or were wounded in this process or who today still fear for their lives. Last year we observed the 90th anniversary of the 19th Amendment of the U.S. Constitution, which gave women the right to vote. And it reminds us that change does not ever come easily, but it does come. In a wonderful editorial by Gail Collins in the New York Times, she reminded us that that 70-year struggle that started in Seneca Falls had involved 56 referendum campaigns directed against male voters. 480 campaigns to get legislators to submit suffrage amendments to voters. 47 campaigns to get constitutional conventions to write women's suffrage planks into state constitutions. 277 campaigns to get state party conventions to include women's suffrage planks. 30 campaigns to get presidential party campaigns to include women's suffrage planks. And 19 campaigns with 19 successive conferences. Change came slowly, but it did come, and we have seen that in reviewing these remarkable 50 years of amnesty's uh, existence. In the 63rd year of the existence of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights in the United States, we saw Don't Ask, Don't Tell repealed. And we have seen the President of the United States order the Solicitor General not to defend the Defense of Marriage Act. A federal judge in California, Vaughn Walker, struck down Proposition 8, which defined marriage as only between a man and a woman, saying, Proposition 8 fails to advance any rational basis in singling out gay men and lesbians for denial of a marriage license. Indeed, the evidence shows Proposition 8 does nothing more than enshrine in the California Constitution the notion that opposite-sex couples are superior to same-sex couples. 
His ruling has been challenged, and the Ninth Circuit Federal Court of Appeals has agreed to hear the case, guaranteeing it will reach the U.S. Supreme Court perhaps before the end of this year. And this issue of same-gender marriage will finally be heard and judged on its merits, which are that Proposition 8 violates the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment, violates the Due Process Clause of the 14th Amendment by impinging upon fundamental liberties, singles out gay and lesbian individuals for a disfavored legal status, thereby creating a category of second-class citizens, discriminates on the basis of gender, and discriminates on the basis of sexual orientation. When this does change, uh, as it will in the other 44 states where same-gender marriage is not legal now, it will have been the result of many people working in many NGOs around this country. Now, I have been a human rights activist most of my life and have just recently come to Harvard University, and it's quite interesting to be uh, teaching about human rights when I, uh, in the past, just did human rights. And one thing that I have, uh, have really come to appreciate, if you look at the gains of human rights that these individuals describe that took place in the in the last five decades, not a single one of them has been achieved without the concerted effort of NGOs. That NGOs are what make human rights possible and what advance human rights. Last year I had the privilege of meeting a 90-year-old um, American veteran uh, who was in Paris uh, in 1948. And he talked about 20 to 40,000 people demonstrating outside uh, the, uh, the Palais, where the vote was going to take place on the, on the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, representing many, uh, not, unfortunately there were not human rights organizations at that time, but there were labor organizations, there were religious organizations, there were organizations concerned uh, that this document uh, uh, be passed by the Pledge of the United Nations, uh, and their presence made it so, and yet I've yet to see a single history book that mentions this. Um, it's uh, it was a remarkable uh, time uh, when that document was passed, and Eleanor Roosevelt, I think, recognized that. And uh, uh, tonight we celebrate uh, the achievements of the UDHR over the last 63 years and the achievement of Amnesty International over the last 50. And I'm very proud that these uh, five people to my left uh, each are engaged uh, with NGOs. Uh, each has been engaged with Amnesty International and continues to be but also with or other organizations uh, that advance the human rights agenda uh, and make uh, all of our work possible as human rights activists. So let me thank you for coming tonight. Uh, we're going to uh, open this up to a quick uh, question and answer period of just uh, maybe 10 or 15 minutes. There's microphones here and there if you would like to address questions to any of the panelists. And let me ask also if the panelists would like to address any questions of each other, please feel free to do that uh, as well. But let me thank uh, each of them for coming tonight. None of them live in uh, Cambridge or Boston. They've all come from outside except for, for Josh and myself. So thank you for the effort that you made to be with us tonight. Um, and uh, the floor is open for questions, or feel free to make a short comment if you would like uh, as well.